Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure a few more people will be trickling in. Thanks for coming to uh, our Geography Colloquium series. Uh, just as a reminder for those of you who don't know, let me give you a little foreshadowing. Next week, we have a wonderful session. Our student Veselka winners will be presenting on their projects. So I strongly encourage you to come back for what will be a wonderful series of talks next time. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Miller today. I've known Jennifer in a variety of capacities for, a, for quite a while. Um, so I just wanted to mention some really stunning things about her that sometimes you forget about your colleagues until you pick up the paper about them. Uh, she's won numerous international awards from vendors such as Leica and ESRI, agencies like UCGIS that promote GI science and GIS internationally, the International Association of Landscape Ecologists, AG GIS Specialty Group, and uh, the one I wish I could have had on my CV, she was a Nystrom Award winner. Uh, for the AEG when first coming out. She has, uh, of course, chaired the GIS specialty group in AEG as well, and has a number of recent very interesting publications in a variety of outlets, including Remote Sensing of Environment, IJGI Science, Geography Compass, Ecological Modeling, Professional Geographer, several there, PRS, and the other one I'm most jealous of, although she'll tell you it's a very short Letter, not full length article in PNAS. She has a recent NSF award with a title that has something like 75 words that all start with S. So I'll let you look that up on the web yourself. Um, and lastly, I just want to add, because we're kind of a cool department, she has her own cool sense of balance. In addition to balancing ecology and geographic techniques, techniques she is an avid equestrian type person with uh, international experience. So if you want to know about horse riding uh, in in all sorts of interesting areas, just ask. And she's also an accomplished pub trivia champion. So please help me welcome Dr. Jennifer Miller. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing the talks from my various colleagues over the past two years. And everybody's had these really interesting sort of big picture, here's what I've done, or the, the really interesting things that I've done over the span of my career. And, so when I thought of giving a talk, I realized that the, a lot of the stuff that I've been presenting at conferences is relatively small picture. So I tried to tease out a sort of a, 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 at least a relatively bigger picture theme that is something that uh, the stuff that I've been doing recently has in common. So that's where I landed on the simulated data aspect because it sort of is something that I've been using in a couple of different application areas. So, I decided to just make this kind of a, start off with a general overview of how simulated data are used in uh, biogeographical applications, and then talk about the two specific applications that I've used. One of them is still really preliminary. The grant that I got with the, the very alliterative title um, is one of these applications, so I'm just going to report on a pretty small preliminary pilot study that I did um, in order to write the proposal. And then the second one is um, something that's a little bit more recent. Uh, related to using simulated data for animal movement. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, species distribution modeling as one of the application areas and then models of species movement as another application area. So I'll just give a little bit of background because I know at least a lot of you know, geographers were a pretty uh, widely varying discipline, so I don't expect that if you're a geographer that you automatically know exactly what um, species distribution modeling encompasses. So just the little brief background, um, generally speaking, it's just some variety of, of models that are used to quantify environmental relationships between environmental conditions and species distributions, and they can be used for kind of um, basic inventory or species atlas purposes um, to figure out or to, to determine likely spread of invasives and vector-borne diseases. And then the really hot topic lately has been to use them to study the effects of environmental change. So, um, you've probably seen either maps or else charts that show how species will, uh, species ranges will expand or contract as a result of increasing temperature. Those are most likely based on some combination of environmental envelopes or some, some type of species distribution model. So those are a really hot application area and um, I'll talk about some of the issues associated with their use. So this is the background of the process for species distribution modeling. It's, Typically static, probabilistic, correlative models, um, inductive approach generally, 
where you start with spatially referenced species observations, GIS layers of important environmental factors. Um, I'll talk about some of the issues related to the modeling part. Uh, you pick a model to use it with, you find some sort of equation that relates the, the environmental variables to the species distributions, and then you can make predictions or forecasts using the, the continuous GIS layers. And then, of course, you're interested in doing some sort of accuracy assessment of the outcome. Um, so each one of these steps actually involves a number of different sources of uncertainty that comes up in the sense of anybody who sees these maps that show this is how much this species range is going to contract if temperature increases by one, you know, one degree in the next 50 years, there's a huge amount of uncertainty associated with those maps. Not just with something that's probably intuitive, like the type of model that's used, but every subjective decision and even more objective decisions along the way can produce vastly different outcomes, vastly different maps. And when those maps are being used to inform um, you know, conservation decisions and things like that, it's, it's a little bit troubling that you know, we, can't, we can't get rid of uncertainty, but the best way to handle it is to at least represent it or convey some uh, level of uncertainty. So in terms of just the data, just this part right here, the sampling strategy that's used, this is, this is particularly a problem lately because people have started using um, already compiled species data from museum inventories and things like that that are based on usually some sort of opportunistic or biased sampling strategy from how many years ago. Um, measurement level, whether you're measuring, whether the data have been measured at presence absence level or abundance or richness or just categorical. Um, prevalence is, I'll come back to that in a second. Partitioning, so once you've got your modeling data set, your, your uh, observations of presence, absence, or abundance, or um, type of vegetation, you decide to partition that into a training data set that you make the models with, and then a test data set that you assess the accuracy with. Even the choices that you make, or the, the way that you decide to partition the data, has implications for what the maps look like at the end. Collinearity, the variables that you use are most likely correlated with each other, and spatial autocorrelation, all of those things are data issues that result in uncertainty in, in the uh, outcomes. Um, the methods that are used, anybody who's into, who, who's dabbled in species distribution modeling at all, it's become a bit overwhelming because it seems like every six months or so, a new model is created that has some sort of um, you know, cryptic uh, abbreviation or um, some sort of weird name. And, They've, none of these exactly is, has a particularly memorable name like CART, BRT, RF, GLM. All of these things are different statistical methods that are, these are actually some of the more commonly used methods um, in species distribution modeling. Each of them has different assumptions. Each of them has different requirements for the data, both input, um, both pr uh, response and predictor variables. Um, and each of them has a sort of different outcome. And they're also usually different enough. Some of them are parametric, like GLM. So most of those listed are non-parametric. So the way that you can compare them is even problematic. Um, um, this is just some, some results that I had as, uh, from a few years ago that shows this is Joshua Tree as the result of five different models. And you can see how different the predictions are just based on the same models, but same, same input data, same uh, training data, same test data, just different um, models that were used. Um, and then the evaluation. So once you've made the, all of these subjective decisions about the data that you're collecting or using, the methods that you're going to use, the calibration of the methods that you're going to use, then somehow you're going to get some sort of output. Most of the time what, what you get is some map of pre probability or suitability of presence um, of a particular species. And that depends on somebody on a, on a subjective decision made about what should the threshold be. For example, logistic regression produces a continuous probability surface from zero to one. Most um, you know, conservationists, most people who are managing this type of data want something that's discrete, presence, absence. So a decision has to be made about what's the threshold above which you're going to assume things are present and below which you're going to assume things are absent. 0.5 has been proven empirically to not be a good choice unless you have a completely equal amount of presence absence in the data set, which hardly ever happens. The accuracy metric that is used also can uh, 
resulting various um, that various accuracies. That'll make sense hopefully in a second. And then extrapolation. When you actually use the algorithm as a result of the statistical method, the GIS data, and you predict the either the, the uh, continuous species distribution or you predict it into the future, that extrapolation then ha looks really different based on all of these um, sources of uncertainty. And then, of course, you can imagine there's sort of interactions between the sources of uncertainty. So here's some stuff that I've done with, um, this is the Mojave Desert and Joshua Tree. And this is the result of the GLM, the logistic regression of a Joshua Tree model, where you can not see too well, but anything that's a green dot here is what was observed to be present in the test data. The test data weren't used at all in the creation of the model. So anything that's dark purple and green means that it, that was a good job. The model did a, a good job of predicting something that really was present to be present. But nobody wants to use this continuous probability. So based on a threshold of 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0.3, and so on, you can see how the different binary maps look. And then presumably all the, each one of these different thresholds is going to result in a different accuracy metric, because most accuracy metrics are based on confusion matrices developed with binary presence access. So here's an example of the same data, same uh, Joshua Tree GLM model. And these are some of the more commonly used accuracy metrics. Um, PCC is percent correctly classified. Kappa is the same one that people who do remote sensing are familiar with. Sensitivity is how well present were predicted. Specificity is how well absent are predicted. PPP is positive predictive power, and NPP is negative predictive power, which is sort of in, uh, related to sensitivity and specificity. So here's based on each of the thresholds. And this is what the accuracy metric is. So you can see that not only is there pretty wild variation among the different accuracy metrics, but there's also wide variation among the probability threshold that you pick. So, you know, if I wanted to get the most accurate models, I could use a really low threshold and I could do great at predicting all of the present, but that's probably because I predicted the whole map to be present, so I didn't miss any present, but I also predicted a lot of what are really absent to be, um, to be present, and that's why my specificity is so poor here. So all of these things are really variable, and most of, pe most of the people who do a lot of stuff with species distribution modeling, we don't ever want to see just one accuracy metric, and we want to see some range of these values that conveys the uncertainty associated with all of these subjective decisions. Okay, so th these sources of uncertainty come from two different places. But they're not in, they're not um, interrelated. They're they're not independent of each other. So the statistical sources of uncertainty that I just talked about, data methods and evaluation, and then there are ecological sources of uncertainty or ecological factors that affect model performance. Things like habitat tolerance, um, range size, dispersal ability, interactions and competition, detectability, response to environmental radiance, and some things can actually be both of these. So the idea of a species being rare, species rarity is an ecological uh, characteristic, and that comes into a, a statistical characteristic when you think of prevalence, which is the number of present in a sample, which is hardly ever greater than 0.5. You usually have something closer to 10 or 20% of the sample is present, and so that would be like 0.1 or 0.2 prevalence. Um, so all of these things relate to, or all of these things are factors affecting model performance. Okay, so now I'll shift to modeling species movement, which I coined the MSM, because SDM already, already has been coined, so I'm trying to follow along on that and coin an equally boring um, abbreviation for modeling species movement. So the background of modeling species movement I'm less familiar with, but I've just started getting inter interested um, in it. And slate shift in a couple of in ways uh, in addition to just this. Um, basically, models of species movement are interested in, in developing models of realistic movement behavior um, in order to infer how organism environment interacts, interacts to influence the movement process. So there have been things that have been written about different states and how an individual state affects their movement characteristics. Um, and then also used to infer movement from incomplete data. We now actually have a huge amount of um, radio collar, GPS collar data that give us movement information, but it's not complete. At really good uh, temporal scales, you can get, you know, so there have been some stuff done in um, 
cities with foxes uh, trying to track interactions for rabies that can actually get um, five minute intervals, which is great, but that's still not complete movement, right? We just know where that fox was at one five minute at, at a bunch of five minute intervals. Um, so modeling species movement questions are things like how does movement relate to habitat resource availability? Um, under what conditions do different types of movement occur? So the framework that I'm going to use in the simulated data example for um, species movement is based on random walk, which has been empirically um, proven to be related with, any, with most animal searching behavior. So if you put an animal in a landscape and the animal searching around for food or for some other resources, that actual, the movement pattern that they follow is really close to what is considered a random walk. Foraging, dispersing, and migrating are different, but they also have generalizable um, movement parameters in terms of average step distance, average step lengths, um, net displacement, and the average turning. And other questions are things like what is the likelihood that an animal will move through a particular cell in a landscape? So in terms of using um, simulated data for both of these applications, there's a slightly different conceptual basis, I think, for the stuff that I found for species distribution or the use of virtual data or simulated data for species distribution modeling versus models of species movement. Most of the applications that use simulated data for species distribution modeling want to, to create some sort of virtual or truth map to pretend like we know exactly where this thing is. I know exactly what the distribution is of this particular species. And then I'm going to sample from that that true distribution, use a couple of models, make some predictions, and then I compare my predictions to what I now know is true. Because we never know truth in real life. In real life, you end up comparing some part of your data to another part of your data, and you don't know what is, is exactly right. Um, so with species distribution modeling applications, it's really important how you create this, this truth map. And most of the time, it's based on explicit ecological theory. There are a, a handful of ecological assumptions that are made to develop um, these, most of these truth or true distribution maps. With modeling species movement, the shift is that instead of assuming that we know truth and we want to see how closely an animal's movement patterns come to truth, we start at the other end and we compare it to randomness. So it's more like using a null model of random movement in the landscape, and then see how much an animal moves based on, or comparing it to randomness. So with species distribution, we pretend like we know everything and we want to see how much our models, or how much our predictions converge to this knowing everything. And with animals, we pretend like if, if there was nothing else going on, no interesting um, states or behavior patterns or anything, and they were moving randomly in the landscape, that's our null model, and we're interested in how much the actual movements di diverge from that null model. Okay, so this has been really interesting to me because I assumed that simulated data applications are really new, right? Because computers are, you know, the speed that with which these things usually are, uh, uh, depend relies on really fast computers and processing speed and so on. But this was one of the first examples that I saw of. Um, simulated data, and this is in an animal movement. Um, so this is 1954, and this one, she actually used a pencil and a graph paper, and she had made little random traps as little squares on the graph paper, and she used her pencil to simulate random movement trajectories, and then she would write down those trajectories and then pretend like any time the simulated animal, she didn't even try to make it uh, follow a real animal, ended up in one of those traps she calculated what the trajectory was based on just the mark um, recapture data and then compared that to the real trajectories based on her pencil simulations. So that was one of the first examples of simulated data in biogeography. Um, most of the species distribution modeling related examples are testing ordination methods. Um, so that was kind of, so in that case it's kind of less similar to this truth habitat suitability map that, that people are more often using now because these are usually theoretical um, Gaussian response curves along virtual gradients. So it's a little bit different than um, the way things are done now. So that's a 1969 example. Minchin actually developed, a, um, I think, a Fortran 
software package called Compass that would actually calculate virtual species in a virtual environment um, to test ordination methods. And then this is another movement, a more recent movement um, example. And now they're calling this virtual biologists. So back to, to simulated data for species distribution modeling. So if you're using simulated data and you're pretending like you know the truth, the question that you ask shifts from how well does the model fit the data to how well does the model represent, represent simulated reality. So again, the way that you're representing simulated reality becomes extremely important. Um, so what's, what's been done in most of these applications is focusing on one of these aspects. So for data, you could focus on sampling strategy, limited access, spatial autocorrelation in the data, observation issues, detection, um, less of a problem with plants, although some plants are cryptic depending on the season, more of a problem with animals where there's been stuff written about how you need to visit a site X number of times in order to be confident that that animal, that, a pre that an absence for that animal truly is absent and he wasn't just out getting food or something. So all of these things can be tested using simulated data as true. And you could actually use this to sort of reverse engineer and decide actually develop a sampling strategy for real data that's meant to achieve a certain accuracy given that you've got certain um, budget constraints, um, given that you've got, you can only go a certain distance away from main roads and things like that. In terms of methods, so these are the ones that have been, that have really been popping up because actually they, they have just started popping up, but we need many more of them because after that explosion of GARP and Maxent, um, BRT, all of those models, a lot of studies came out right then that compared them, but they used real data. And so what you got at the end was these really situation-specific winners. Like, this is the best model if your data look exactly like the ones that, that were used to test it. So it was it really left with a, an inability to draw generalizations or conclusions about what's the best modeling method to use in certain circumstances. Um, under what circumstances does the model best represent truth? And then evaluation. So these are things where most of the studies using real data, we're stuck using prediction accuracy, which is overall okay because for most of these situations, that's the most important result anyway. But anytime you have different models, you can't use something like an R squared or some measure, or some diagnostic measure of model fit because models have different error structures and different assumptions and things like that. So prediction accuracy has been the one that's used most often, but there are a host of other factors that would presumably determine what is a good uh, model result from a poor model result. So things like correct selection of predictor variables, accurate description of species response, and does the model make ecological sense um, are also important criteria that can be used. Okay, so a couple of different approaches have been used to, to um, model virtual species. Um, in virtual landscapes, these are the typically the ones that, that were used to test ordination methods, like compass. But more recently, the interest has shifted to modeling virtual species in a real landscape. So in that case, you basically use real environmental variables, and you derive some functional algorithm that is most likely related to actual relationships between that species and the environment, and you use that to predict what, the thing that you're going to consider the true habitat suitability. Um, so this is based on, and these, these things are also based on um, what sort of uh, questions you're asking. So ecological assumptions are things like, it, um, my species are, most of the assumptions involve my species are in, a, are in equilibrium with the environment. Um, what type of response does the species have to environmental gradients? For climate change studies, the really um, hot new application area recently, you have a lot of other ecological assumptions you have to deal with, like does the species maintain its climate niche in the future? Um, what about dispersal? How do you treat dispersal? Do you either assume that it can disperse wherever it needs to once the climate has changed a little bit, or do you assume it can't disperse at all, or something in between? And interactions. What about interactions with other species? What about feedback effects? Um, and then functional relationships. Um, Multiple factors, nonlinear relationships, usually non-additive relationships, all of these things then help you determine what, what is the most appropriate statistical method to use to create your um, virtual or your, your true habitat distribution. 
The other advantage is that you can use these at spatial and temporal scales that are really difficult to study in real life. In fact, most often impossible to study in real life. Okay, um, and then with models of species movement, these are typically because we're not interested in trying to derive this truth, which has a lot, which is based on a lot of assumptions. With models of species movement, we really want to just base it on a couple of key uh, generalizations about the, the parameters associated with movement. Okay, so a lot of stuff has been written, um, mostly involving <laughs> insects. A lot of stuff on grasshoppers, um, uh, beetles, um, even some uh, things in water, bottlenose dolphins and animals like that. And a couple of different types of motion have been uh, hypothesized as, as being more accurate to, to describe these sort of um, general search patterns of movement like Brownian motion, levy walks. Levy walks are like the fractal equivalent of um, random walks where they're scale invariant. The one that I'm focusing on and the one that things seem to have shifted to in general is using random walks. And random walks, just like they sound, you start at a, a point in the landscape and then you can consider all of the potential directions that that uh, species can move in and all of the potential step lengths as a distribution from which one is selected randomly. And then that determines the direction that it starts in and the step length. So random walks are purely random, but then there have been a couple of new variations of random walks, correlated random walks and biased correlated random walks. And these incorporate a little bit more information like correlated random walks allow you to generalize about the, pop, about the um, movement characteristics of a, spe of a specific individual so that you can basically include information like what is the mean step length of all of its movements that it made? What's the turn angle that it used most often in all of these movements that it made? And then biased correlated random walks, it's, it's sort of like having an external drift for um, creating. So it's when you can include the information that overall the animal is going to be making these movements in a correlated random walk way, but it's trending towards a specific direction. So if it's heading towards a water hole or something like that, it's, that's going to be the, um, the bias. And then what we're interested in using um, simulated data for animal movement is the deviation of the actual movement from these null models, from these random walks, so that you can make statements like, well, if my net displacement is overpredicted, that is, if my random walk ended up having a net displacement that's greater than my real net displacement, then that means that that animal kind of hung around that area more than I would have expected, possibly suggesting a preferential habitat. If the net displacement is underpredicted, then that suggests that there's some sort of avoidance that's going on for that animal. So he's moving out of there more quickly than he would have otherwise. Okay, so I'm going to just, now I'll focus on these two as case studies. So this is the one that uh, is really preliminary. Um, but it's based on my results from my dissertation research, which some of you might have had a similar thing where the results were a little muddled. So my dissertation was on how should spatial autocorrelation be incorporated in species distribution modeling. And I used about 15 different species and several different models, several different ways of incorporating spatial autocorrelation. And I didn't find any sort of congruity in the results at all. Um, and part, there were a number of reasons why that happened, which I spent a good deal of the dissertation talking about. Um, but I've since followed up on this area. And it's kind of gotten a little bit interesting lately with a, a couple of um, interesting publications. Some of the things that people can generally agree on about the results of that spatial autocorrelation has, uh, spatially autocorrelated data have on, in species distribution modeling, um, the consequences of, or is that the precision of coefficients is decreased and there's an increased likelihood of type 1 error. We can all pretty much agree on that. Variable selection is typically predisposed towards more strongly autocorrelated predictors termed the redshift by Lennon. And not related to that is that broad scale predictors are often selected over local or fine scale predictors. And depending on your method of incorporating spatial autocorrelation, it can completely overwhelm environmental variables. And what you're really interested in is what effect does the environment have, what effect does spatial autocorrelation have, and what effect does spatially structured environment have, which is really difficult to disentangle the way most of these studies are set up. So most of these studies, and this has been a big area in the last six or seven years, 
Most of these studies that, um, that test spatial autocorrelation, the effect of spatial autocorrelation in these studies, compare one spatial method to one non-spatial method. And then they present the results, and then they try and make conclusions about, well, this is what the effect of spatial autocorrelation is. So typically, they'll use ordinary least squares as the non-spatial method, generalized least squares as the spatial method, and then show you the results. One thing that has been um, presented in the results for a couple of these studies, starting in 2000, a lot of people have written that, the, that it results in biased coefficient estimates. And in statistics, a biased coefficient estimate has a really specific meaning, right? It means that a coefficient has some value. The, prediction, the predicted value of that coefficient is different from the true value. So we, but we can't say whether any of these coefficient estimates is biased, whether it's the coefficient estimates produced by the, the non-spatial methods or the spatial methods, because we don't know what the true value is. So often what happens in these studies is they find that both models produce different coefficient estimates. One of them might be biased, but you have no idea which one is biased unless you know exactly what the true value is. Um, another thing, these, this, a lot of these studies, this Lennon study in particular, the, one of their conclusions also in a later study was that the OLS results were similar enough to the GLS results that we shouldn't have to worry about spatial autocorrelation and species distribution modeling, but their study was at a 100 kilometer grid cell um, resolution, which is not really realistic for a lot of other studies. And you know, we could argue the, the effects of spatial autocorrelation at 100 kilometer um, scale. Anyway, so generally, most of these studies have made it difficult to disentangle the effects of spatial structure in the data, especially when they use compiled data which are, you might have been based on some sampling paradigm from uh, you know, several years ago that is meant to, to try and reduce the amount of spatial autocorrelation by only selecting observations that are at least a certain distance away from the next observation. Um, sampling strategy, the scale of the study, whether you're looking at 100 kilometer grid cells or whether you're looking at 10 kilometer or 10 meter grid cells, and the statistical methods used. So it's not really a fair comparison to compare one spatial method to one non-spatial method with real data and then pretend like you know which one of them performed better when you don't know what the real data, what, what the, uh, you don't have a, a more objective way of determining it. So this is exactly what I found. These are the results from my dissertation stuff or a couple of years after that. And these don't really make any sense. Well, I mean, they don't, they're not nonsense, but there's no real pattern that you can see here because Basically, depending on different types of species, this one is really rare, this one is really common, um, the different methods, there was no real uh, clear take-home message about which method, which type of um, species uh, performed better in terms of incorporating spatial autocorrelation. So this led me into the, the idea of using simulated data to use this virtual um, habitat distribution that I know, the, I know the true distribution, so then I can run all of my tests, and instead of hopefully getting something really confused like this, where I don't know whether some of these models are performing poorly because of data issues, or because of method issues, or because of spatial autocorrelation issues, now at least I can hold one of those moving parts steady, and then just see how the rest of the things operate. So this is, um, so this is a pilot study I did um, sort of recently. So I'm interested in testing different levels of spatial autocorrelation in calculating the true distribution map, different sampling strategies and densities. So you also just sample from your true distribution map, trying to mimic as much as you can a real sampling strategy. So if you were going to use a gradient-directed sampling strategy in real life, you can devise a gradient-directed sampling strategy with the, the, um, the true distribution map and then testing different statistical methods that incorporated spatial autocorrelation. So I was calling this my virtual Joshua tree map because it was based on a real, real environmental variables and um, a fuzzy suitability map of Joshua tree. Um, but I don't want to, this is, I don't feel comfortable talking in too much detail about this since it was a pilot study. And I added randomness to see how that affected the model. And then I added a broad scale trend and then um, I think I also added uh, more fine scale neighborhood autocorrelation and then a couple of different sampling strategies and then three different models that treat spatial autocorrelation differently. So the first one was just regular non-spatial logistic regression. The second one is auto logistic regression, which includes, along with the environmental variables, 
um, a neighborhood variable that just uh, incorporates the information on whether any of the neighbors around the cell was present or did have Joshua tree in it. And then geographically weighted regression, which doesn't really treat spatial autocorrelation explicitly, but it allows coefficients to have different values across space. So it's a way of getting at spatial non-stationarity, which is a related, term, a related concept to spatial autocorrelation. So now, so these were the results that I got using different random sample, systematic sample, and different densities for the different models. And some of the generalizations that I could make from this was that geographically weighted regression had the highest accuracy and the biggest difference when randomness was added to the data. Um, the auto-logistic model was better than logistic regression at the highest density, which makes sense because it's something that relies on being able to calculate the neighborhood around it, which degrades um, seriously once you have um, fewer samples available. Um, geographically weighted regression was the most robust with the random data added. Um, other than the auto-logistic regression with uh, the truth model, reducing the sample size didn't affect the accuracy. So nice generalizations there. So that's, that was my pilot study that's leading to what I'm, I'm now working on um, for this grant for the next three years. So I'll hopefully have more interesting results in a couple of years about that. So now this leads to the second case study, which looks at animal movement. Um, and instead of just animal movement, you can think of this in statistical parlance as a second order property of movement. So what's the interaction among or between individuals? just looking at two individuals at a time, what's the nature of interactions between brown hyena pairs and northern Botswana? So that's a very specific question, and I can thank Kelly and Toroff for the reason that this is as specific as it is. So this wasn't just me getting into animal movement and you know, looking for a data set. This was sort of a, um, a nice synergistic um, real collaboration that happened with a friend of theirs in Botswana. So this was the question that, um, that this guy asked a couple of years ago. Because he, he was a brown hyena um, ecologist, and he had all kinds of information on brown hyenas, but not a really clear idea. He knew that this is what he wanted to study, but he didn't really have a clear idea spatially how to address this question. Um, so species interactions actually have important, there. it's worth studying for a couple of different reasons in terms of characterizing mating and territorial behavior, resource use, and then a lot of the stuff that I found was related to infectious disease. Specifically, urban populations of foxes and raccoons and the ability to transmit rabies related to how often they interact with each other. For the hyenas, it was particularly interesting because it's much less, big mammals are much less studied in, in these contexts than um, either insects or else smaller mammals. So some social and spatial behavior of brown hyenas, um, they live in small clans, usually 2 to 12 individuals with large home ranges. The breeding is non-seasonal, um, they're solitary foragers, and they use scent markings and these things called pastings to actually leave tracks at the edges of their ranges that then convey to other hyenas, usually in, within their own clan, I've already foraged here, so don't waste your time, I've, you know, I basically used all the resources here. Um, they're typically solitary, but they do socialize at carcass sites, water holes, and communal dens. Um, another interesting thing which was surprising to me was that the females actually don't mate with their the, uh, fellow members of their clan. They typically only mate with what are called interlopers, so other male hyenas from another clan that cross in. Um, so here's the study area around the Magadigadi and Zaipan National Park, about 4,800 square kilometers. Um, the GPS collar data was collected by Glenn from June 2004 to December 2007, and we have it for three different, well, two different seasons and then the combination of both of those seasons. So the lean season, which was roughly between June and September, but it varied every season because it really depended upon when the um, zebra and the wildebeest migrated into the area. And then the, that was the peak season, and then the lean season was when they migrated out. So Glenn had to actually go through for each year, figure out what constituted the lean season, what constituted the peak season, based on when these things came in and came out. Um, and then all season is just the combination of all of the dates. So I, for this particular application, I just focused on 12 individuals, um, seven females, five, sorry, yeah, seven females, five males, in this case, just one different, one clan, um, and eight dyads. So a dyad is just a particular combination of two individuals. 
And of the dyads, two were female, female, and six were female, male. Um, and we looked at interactions that were within one hour of each other and 500 meters, presuming that that was close enough, Glenn hypothesized that 500 meters was close enough in space that one individual would be aware of another individual. And then one hour, because that was the temporal resolution of the data. And it seemed reasonable to think that they're not like um, insects or uh, something else that you really need uh, finer resolution temporal data, or it certainly wouldn't justify. So what we were interested in finding out is, do individuals interact more or less than they would if they were moving randomly across their range? So Glenn's initial hypothesis was that they interact less than they would if they were moving randomly across the range because they have these really elaborate strategies to keep track of where they've been so that the other individuals will stay away from that area. And then if so, are there sex, age, and seasonal differences associated with these, inter these different types of interactions? So then, so this is where um, my part came in. So how can these random interaction rates be modeled? So this is when I started doing sort of an extensive literature review of how to model interaction rates. And some of the um, older stuff, and by older I just mean like 20 years or so, used actually I, things like ideal gas laws to predict the rates and durations of interaction as a function of population density, velocity, and threshold distance to figure out sort of population parameters of what a, what a population's um, interaction rates would be based on how many individuals were there, the size of the, of the range, and so on. And these were things that were typically done with small mammals, and again, usually urban populations that were pretty, able to be pretty intensively studied. Another way that this was done was to actually just calculate the spatial overlap of the home range, but that's what um, somebody has called static interaction, because two animals can have a completely, almost completely overlapping home range, but they might both use the slightly different parts of the home range more intensively. Or they could have only sort of medium overlapping home ranges, but they use that overlapping area really intensively. So, just the, the mere spatial overlap of the home range doesn't really give you an idea as to the spatio-temporal nature, uh, uh, nature of the interaction. Um, so I found this in a, in a paper. There was, a, conveniently enough, a whole special issue on animal movement in the Philosophical Transa Transactions of the Royal Society of Biological um, Science in 2010. And this says a useful null model for encounter rates is one where indivi individuals move randomly and independently of, of each other. So that's basically a, core, a random walk at the most basic level, and then you could add correlation and bias to it if you wanted to. So then I actually um, found these two that, were, that predated that. So this guy, Doncaster, is the one that, that coined the term static interaction and dynamic interaction. So he calls something a dynamic interaction when it's likely that two individuals are actually affected by each other. So that means that they're in the same place, or in the same uh, space, they're within a certain threshold, spatially and temporally. Whatever that threshold is, spatially and temporally. So for our hyenas, the um, spatial threshold was 500 meters, the temporal threshold was an hour. So he did a lot of work, I think he also did this with fox, fox uh, populations in Oxford. And he used a method that I'll talk about in a second, um, where he basically compared the frequency above and below this distance threshold for n matched pairs with n squared minus n matched pairs. So this is an, a, a, a sort of like using simulation the way that you could do it in Excel, where if I have x and y of each individual for individual one and x and y for individual two, there's a certain number of those that are matched where they're taken all at the same time. So I'm interested in figuring out how many of those matches occurred below that spatial threshold, and that becomes one value, and then I match up all of the others. Every time this individual was recorded versus every time that this other individual was recorded, and I get n squared minus n unmatched pairs. So it's a completely um, simulated data exercise that's non-spatial. You could do it in Excel, and it doesn't have anything to do with real movement. You're really just using every time, every, every point in space that this individual was with every point in space this other individual was. And then every point in space it was here with every point in space the other one was. Um, but that was one method. And then a couple of years later, White and Harris actually were the first ones to use a random walk data as that the basis for that null model. And again, um, foxes uh, for rate dispersal. So I calculated correlated random walks using this 
software package here, which if anybody here is familiar with um, what used to be called Hoff's Tools, I think it probably still is called Hoff's Tools, it's now been reconfigured as this geospatial modeling environment, which is great, um, and it's really a, an interface between the R programming language and ArcGIS. So I calculated correlated random walks that were based on the actual starting point of each of my individuals for each of the seasons, lean, peak, and all. Um, the, the movement parameters, so I used every movement that that individual made during the lean season, during the peak season, during all seasons, and calculated the average step length, the standard deviation step length, and the turn angle parameters. Um, since it's for turn angles, it's more appropriate to use an, indi an index of um, concentration rather than means and standard deviations. I used, um, I think, I forget the name of it, it's Kaussian or some, some distribution like that. So basically, it's the modal angle and rho is a concentration parameter. The number of steps that each one took in the real data, and then the home range. And this one was the only software package a year and a half ago that would actually allow you to create correlated random walks that were um, restricted by a polygon like a home range. So I did 100 correlated random walks for each individual season combination. And this is what they look like. So here's the actual data for a male Hulu and a female Pudu. This is the actual data for the peak season in 2005, 2006. 1,114 observations that occurred from Christmas 2005 to um, April 8, 2006. And then here's what the simulated data, just one of the 100 runs looked like for the simulated data. So green is Pudu's range, purple is Pulu's range, and this is what the code looks like for the geospatial modeling environment. Um, Okay, here's the second one. So basically I did, I generated 100 runs for Pulu, 100 runs for Pudu, and then I matched them up to see how many times each one of these observations was within 500 meters in space of each other and one hour in time of each other. And here's the GIS details which probably aren't gonna be interesting here. And this is what I came up with. So in this particular simulation, Four of these things were dynamic interactions. So there were four instances where these two observations, these two simulated observations, but one of the things that was happening with the real data that wasn't happening with the simulated data is that there were a lot of what I was calling layovers. So a lot of times the two individuals be, would be in the same place at, say, 11 p.m., same place at 12 p.m., same place at 1 a.m. Most of this is probably because they had found something that was dead and they were eating on it together. So if I take away, and we're still not quite sure how, to really, how those should really be treated, but I, I don't think that, they, that it should truly be 47, that it should count as 47 dynamic interactions. So if I take away all of those layovers, I get 11 non-consecutive interactions for this particular uh, dyad season combination. Here's another, and I'm not gonna go through all eight of these, there's just another one. Cyril is another male and Honey was a female, and this is the range overlap between the blue and the purple polygons is 0.92, so more overlap here. Um, this is the lean season 2007. They had 1,030 observations, 122 were dynamic interactions, but only 29 were non-consecutive. Their mean distance apart for the real data is much smaller than Hulu and Pudu were. So 29 non-consecutive interactions here versus 11 in this particular um, one of the 100 simulation exercises. And also a larger uh, mean kilometer distance, mean distance apart for the matching observations. So uh, the ways that th this information can be summarized, this is what Glenn was interested in, which for geographers, I kept saying, don't you want a map? Don't you want anything like that? And he just wanted to summarize this information in tables. So just comparing the simulated data here to the actual data. And as you can see, he found in all of these cases that they were farther apart on average and the dynamic interactions occurred far less frequently. But I suspect a lot of that is because of the way that he didn't do anything about those um, layovers. Here's another way that, and so these after, he, I think that was for his dissertation and then I found a couple of other ways to summarize the information since then. So here's one way to actually show the frequency distribution of the number of um, dynamic interactions based on 100 sets of simulations. So I did 100 sets of these simulations. Each one of them produced a number of dynamic interactions that ranged from 
Uh, about four of them only had one dynamic interaction to 12, uh, sorry, one of them had 12 dynamic interactions. So this is basically the distribution of dynamic interactions based on 100 simulations. And this is what the real data had. So I haven't actually run this through a statistical test like a Poisson distribution, but I'm guessing that this would be statistically significantly different. And then this was Pulu and Pudu. Um, again, same frequency distribution based on 100 sets of simulations where not as many um, overall dynamic interactions as uh, Honey and Cyril. And then this is where the real data, the number of real data, non, um, uh, not, not layover data, ended up. So also what would probably be statistically significant. This is the way that Doncaster summarized his information using his basically elaborate Excel spreadsheet of different XY coordinates being matched up with other XY coordinates. So he ran, a, this is a non-parametric test, but you can run chi-squared tests to see how different each of these distributions is, or each of these bin distributions is. So this is Pudu and Pulu in peak 2005-2006, the one that we just looked at, and this is looking at four different distance bins, four different thresholds. So less than or equal to 500, which was the one we were really interested in, 500 to 2,000, 2,000 to 7,500, and then how many of those matches were actually greater than 7,500 apart. So blue is the real match data, red is my real unmatched data, which was the following that sort of Excel spreadsheet XY matching um, uh, contest that where you end up with n squared minus n cases. And then green is based on my correlated random walks matched to another correlated, correlated random walk. And I did this, I'm showing this one because it's got four bins, but I also did it just using 500 meters as the cutoff. Because it's far more likely to be statistically insignificant for, for 500 meters than when you use four bins. So if it was statistically significant for four bins, it was most likely statistically significant for two bins. So in this case, real matched is different from both of my null models, the real unmatched and the simulation matched at both levels, the four of the bins that I'm showing here and just using 500 meters as the cutoff. And real unmatched was not different from the sim matched at either level. So what that means is my two null models were not different from each other, which was, I think, a good thing, but didn't stay that way. Um, so this is Honey and Cyril. Honey and Cyril, again, the real, the real data was significantly different from both the unmatched and sim matched at both using four bins and two bins, but real unmatched was statistically significantly different from the simulated matched using four bins. And you can kind of see that here. The red and the green do not look very similar here. So that's a little troubling if both of my null models are statistically significantly different. Um, so I tried to summarize these, but like I said, I didn't have a, a huge number of dyads to make any really uh, great conclusions. But um, overall, this is the lean, lean season. There were nine dyads, peak season six, all five. Um, and this shows the proportion of, of male-female pairs that were less than 500 meters apart. So a lot more during the peak season, um, a lot more with the real matched data than any of the two null model types of data. And then this is proportion of female-female pairs. This was the only one for which I actually had two cases, so I don't really, you know, this is based on one case and this is based on one. So um, I can't really make too many conclusions about that. And then I tried to, to figure out some of the other patterns. So what this is showing is, I was seeing, wondering if there was a relationship between the range overlap and the amount of interactions, thinking that maybe if there was a ton of overlap, that's going to affect the significance over, of the interactions. So the y-axis is the range overlap. The x-axis is the number of real matched pairs. Um, blue means that they were statistically significant at both levels, the real matched versus my correlated random walk matched. Purple meant that it was statistically significantly different only using the four bins. And then red meant that it was, wasn't different at either of those bin levels. It wasn't different using just 500 meters as the cutoff or using the four different bin cutoff. So this is using my correlated random walk compared to the real data. And this one was that huge um, n squared minus n um, real unmatched null model. And not really any huge generalizations about the relationship between the range overlap.
So the preliminary results are that the individuals don't seem to be avoiding each other. Male inter male female interactions are greater than female female, but then again, I had two female female samples, um, and the interactions were higher during peak season. Issues that came up were finding a meaningful comparison between the real data and the null models. So I, I've done it a couple of different ways, and I'm still looking for other ways. Um, different method for the random null model, there actually, there's something that's called a step selection function that incorporates species distribution modeling habitat suitability information in the correlated random walk. Because if you could uh, see with the real data, certain parts of the range were more visited or visited more frequently than other parts. So you could actually use information about what types of habitats are more likely to be visited within that range to calculate the correlated random walk which I'd be interested in doing, but again, I think because of the nature of this, if I want to use it as some sort of null model to compare my real movements, I don't want to get too realistic. I don't want to get overly realistic because I'm not trying to model truth with the animal movements. I'm trying to model something that gets at a reasonable estimation of what the movement, what the interactions would be if there was nothing interesting going on, no attraction or avoidance going on, and then see what, what the data, or what the, the real data shows. So virtual biogeography issues, um, the conceptualization of simulated reality is extremely important, as you can imagine. Um, the objective should determine the simulation characteristics. So if you're interested in trying to figure out whether a model can uncover um, species response shapes to environmental gradients, then that needs to be prime, the, the primary focus of how you simulate your true uh, habitat distribution map. Um, why, then of course, Figuring this out allows us to, to go on to questions like, why do these things, why are they different? Once we can establish that there really are differences that aren't specific to the data or the sampling strategy or the spatial scale or the bias or something like that, once we can establish objectively that there are differences, then we can focus on, on uh, the real differences. Simulation, sim these virtual biogeographic methods are much better at discrediting methods than corroborating them. So by that I mean that this is not something where if it works with the simulated data, it doesn't mean that, that it's going to work with real data. What it means is if, if it doesn't work with simulated data, then why bother trying to, you know, if you can't uncover real, uh, real environmental signals with simulated data, why do you think you can uncover them with real data? So if things work really well with simulated data, then go forward and use real data, but if things don't work well with the simulated data, then it's time to stop and reconfigure what you're doing. Um, and then there are issues of mechanistic versus descriptive. Most of this stuff is descriptive, meaning that it doesn't include really detailed information on interactions and things like that. But I've seen a couple of studies that focus on creating um, virtual true projected scenarios based on one or two species and the interactions that they have now and the interactions that they're, they're likely to have in the future. And then, of course, now we've got sources of uncertainty in the input, the simulation process, model assumptions, and parameterization to focus on. But then we never can really get rid of uncertainty. The best we can do is just represent it. So I'll just say thank you to the College of Liberal Arts and NSF and my um, old advisor, Janet, and Glenn Maub is the guy with the hyena data. And Hawthorne Byer is the guy who I've never met, but is extremely responsive over email and is the one that wrote the um, geospatial modeling environment. Thank you. variation. 
So that's where, you know, something that's gradient-directed sampling, which is a great um, use of GIS layers because you can use, you can create these combinations of different environmental gradients, and then you can use the, the, um, the, uh, strat the stratification that each of those combinations produces and just throw random samples onto that. So you still have the, the nice things that you can do with random data, but now you've ensured that you that your random data are distributed along specific environment combinations of environmental gradients, so you're more likely to get rare species and things like that. For the stuff that I do with spatial autocorrelation, that's really tricky to use compiled data because it's, you know, most people have already uh, collected data years ago using this old paradigm of we must make sure that there's a minimum distance between samples, which is great, but if you're then trying to use some method that actually incorporates information on neighbor, neighboring um, values, you can't do it with that data. So that's why one of, the, um, one of the parts of that pilot study was trying to get a way of, of like forcing the samples to be collected at hierarchically spaced distances apart so that you don't have just samples that are within a certain distance from each other, but you have samples that are widely spaced at you know certain distance at certain distances, but also close enough so that you're not removing the spatial structure if you're interested in the spatial structure to begin with. If you don't care about spatial autocorrelation, or if you really are trying to get data so that you don't have to worry about the spatial autocorrelation issues, then definitely you know figure out what the likely spatial scale or the spatial distance is that that beyond which autocorrelation is less of a problem, and sample based on that. So. But I think that um, it's great the way there's all of the, these compiled data sets available, but the problem is that people are sort of using them uncritically and using them to test these assumptions. And I think that those museum inventory data sets in particular are the most biased because it's sort of a lot of times it was people driving around on a road and they saw an animal and so they wrote down the location as best they could and then the name of the animal. And, it's, it's about as opportunistic, I think, as you can get for sampling data. You, you, you try to tackle that spatial autocorrelation issue with presence-absence data. I noticed a lot of your techniques were regression. I mean, you, you bring up the, the museum records, and, and maybe you did and I missed it, but have you tried to tackle it with presence-only data? Have I tried to tackle spatial autocorrelation with presence-only? Yeah. Or any of these methods? No, I actually haven't used presence only data very much myself, and and that's typically what these museum records are, where somebody's look, uh, recorded the observation that something is there, but there's no information on absence. And I think if we go back to that slide about the uncertain or sources of uncertainty, that creates a whole different set of, of uncertainty categories because a lot of these methods are more accurate because there's information on absence. So that you know, you know, it might be suitable habitat there, but because of competition or some sort of dispersal limitation or a historical barrier, that species just isn't there. So I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think presence only methods might have as often accent and things that get amazing accuracy results with presence only data, but I think that, you know, there's, I don't think that they should be treated equally because I think it's more like, you know, one of them is modeling a potential niche versus a realized niche. Um, and that's, I don't think, I mean, I, I think that spatial autocorrelation for max end is less of a problem than with these par parametric methods like logistic regression and things like that. So I think that's probably why the focus has been on that. But technically, um, you know, you could derive some, like an analog to um, a name, like an autologistic uh, value, an autocovariate with any, I think, just about any model. You know, if you just had information on presence, you could calculate a new variable that gave you information on how many neighboring, um, or how, how much other, uh, or how many, what's the proportion of the neighborhood that was also present, and use that in the model, if that was what you were interested in. But most of the time, something like that just ends up overwhelming the environmental factors, which are the things that you're probably more interested in anyway. I have one more. Uh, how did Glenn create <coughs> the boundary for the study area? Because it, it looked, when you put it up there, like he took real data and then drew with a little bit of a buffer around. And I ask because if, when you look at your simulated data versus the real data, in the simulated, you go all the way up to the edge of the buffer, but in the real, they don't. And so you would think that you would be underestimating 
dynamic interactions because you're sending them into an area that they don't actually go. So you see what I mean by the yep. sort of buffer effect? And you're sending them, your model is sending them actually in yeah. there. And you can see with the real data that occasionally, so he didn't use, because I started reading about how home ranges are calculated, and he didn't use something like a con convex hull or something right. that just uses the data and it calculates what it is around that. So, and he put a lot of thought into each one of these home ranges because sometimes he'd send me one and I'd have a problem with it and he'd send me another one that looked almost identical except it might have, maybe it didn't have this little dip right here. Um, but you can see that they go off it with the real ranges and with the simulated ranges, the way these are calculated is that any point here, remember the direction is drawn from this correlated distribution and then the step length is drawn from the correlated distribution. But if it's if those either one of those would result in that step being outside of the range, it's thrown away and another one is drawn. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would think that this this is definitely it's essentially spread out more across it these is, ranges. It's less dense than this one, but it's also going over a much bigger right. area. Right? And that's so why the overlap is different. Right, and you could see that there must be something really attractive over here, mm -hmm. and much less attractive over here, but. I can't, you know, I haven't, I haven't represented that yet, but that would be, I think, as far as I would want to go in terms of representing a little bit more reality of, of, of the differences or the different interaction rates. Paul? You, you probably just answered my question, but did it occur to you to represent carry-on by having, say, a randomly uh, occurring location where there'd be an attractor for a certain amount of time as sort of a dead body that was, was out there and they could be, they'd be attracted if they were downwind. Or did, did you ever get that complex? Wow, I do not. <laughs> but that could be really interesting because so basically locate it randomly and then have it exist for a, a finite time period and only be detectable within a certain spatial. A certain orientation. Wow, yeah, that would be really, I've never even seen that done. That would be really cool. And I think, um, you know, some, I don't know if anybody here is from biology or if you're familiar with uh, agent-based or individual-based models, but I steer clear from them for the most part. But there are similarities because those are simulations and they're individual-based, but I think that the main difference between those types of models and these types of models is that I'm using these, these parameters to model. I know exactly what the movement parameters are for these real individuals, and I'm using that to simulate these Whereas with agent-based or individual-based models, your, the, the population characteristics are emergent properties. So it's similar in a sense, except that it sort of starts out blindly, because I don't know those parameters starting out, and then they emerge as the thing is moving across the landscape. So I, I don't know if, I mean, that would also be another interesting approach for these things, but I'm not, um, until this Hawthorne guy writes an agent-based modeling approach for it, I'm not anywhere near being able to do that yet. Any more questions? All right, then we will um, continue our colloquium tradition of joining Jennifer for drinks over in the cactus. If it's open, if not, we'll wander across the street to Austin's Pizza. Everyone is invited to attend. And let's thank Dr. Miller one more time for a great time.